Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Manis. I'm chair of the Department of Ophthalmology here at UC Davis. Uh, first, I want to extend a very warm welcome to our donor, Mr. Daryl Givicki. As some of you may know, Mr. Givicki unfortunately took ill yesterday and cannot be here with us in person. However, we hope he is either watching live in his hospital room, but this is also being recorded for him. And Mr. Givicki, we want you to know that this is all for you, and we thank you so much for this amazing gift to UC Davis. I would like to welcome Mr. Givicki's colleagues who are here representing him, Mr. Mark Kraft and Ms. Patty Pagala. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We also want to extend a warm welcome to Interim Dean Susan Murin, to Dr. James Brandt, his wife Karen, son Michael and daughter-in-law Casey, and their daughter uh, Zoe, Dr. Brandt's a much adored granddaughter. If any of you have visited our offices, there are pictures of Zoe everywhere. Also want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Nicholas March Armstrong, his wife Karen, and is Auden here? His daughter Auden. Ah, they're in the back. Very good. Welcome to all of you. We really appreciate your being here to celebrate the extraordinary generosity and vision of Daryl Givicki and the inaugural appointments of Dr. Brandt uh, as the holder of the Daryl and Opal Givicki and Dow Chair in Glaucoma and Dr. Nick Marsh Armstrong as the holder of the Daryl and Opal Givicki and Dow Chair in Glaucoma Research. I look forward to sharing more with all of you about Mr. Gevicki, Dr. Brandt, and Dr. Marsha Armstrong later in the program. But now it's my great pleasure to invite to the podium Dr. Susan Murin. As interim dean, Dr. Murin leads our nationally ranked School of Medicine in its mission areas of education, research, clinical care, and community partnership. Throughout her 27-year tenure at UC Davis, Susan Murin has held several prominent leadership roles within the medical school and at UC Davis Health. Most recently, she served as Vice Dean for Clinical Affairs and Executive Director of the UC Davis Medical Group. As a professor and clinician in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, she has been repeatedly named to best doctors in America, both nationally and regionally. She has published extensively and recently served as the deputy editor of CHEST, a leading respiratory journal. Prior to joining UC Davis Health, Dr. Murin served as an officer in the US Air Force Medical Corps. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Murin. Thank you very much, Dr. Manis. Uh, it's a pleasure to join everyone here this evening. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to especially uh, extend my thanks to Mr. Givicki for the extraordinary generosity uh, behind his gift, which will enable trailblazing discoveries and improve the lives of glaucoma patients and their families in our region and more broadly. Mr. Givicki's investment in basic science and translational research will further collaboration on both sides of the causeway. I am proud to share a major milestone for UC Davis. We re recently set a new record and achieved over $1 billion in research funding for the... Uh, That was for the 21-22 academic year. Uh, we just heard about it, and it's uh, obviously a great achievement uh, for us. So of that billion dollars that the university raised last year, uh, about 40% of it was from the School of Medicine, 396 million, which was also a record for our school. Um, so we're, we're doing good things, and the generosity of our donors enables us to do so. Now, through their ambitious research, teamwork, and passion, 
our vision scientists, in collaboration with the Eye Center clinician scientists, are delivering tomorrow's healthcare today and inspiring the next generation of ophthalmologists to discover new treatments and cures. Today's inaugural endowed chairholders are two such leaders. Dr. Nick Marsh Armstrong is conducting comparative profiling and functional studies in frog retina to understand the molecular machinery in retinal ganglion cells, astrocytes, and myeloid cells that enable cell regeneration after injury. This important work is on a pathway to discover how to pursue vision restoration after glaucomatous retinal ganglion cell loss. Really holds the promise of restoring sight. Dr. James Brandt is renowned for his work on the ocular hypertension treatment study, a multi-center randomized study designed to look at the prevention um, of open, of onset of primary open angle glaucoma, forgive me. In addition, Dr. Brandt is one of the few glaucoma specialists worldwide to treat congenital glaucoma. The partnership of groundbreaking faculty researchers like Drs. Brandt and Marsh Armstrong is indicative of our school's vibrant and collaborative research community that makes us the nationally recognized research powerhouse that we have become. Mr. Gavecki's donation helps bring together the expertise of our Center for Vision Science, Center for Ocular Regenerative Therapy, and the new Ernest E. Shannon Eye Institute building, a state-of-the-art facility that is accessible to people with all levels of vision, where stellar faculty and residents will work together to reimagine the possibilities in vision care. Once again, I extend my thanks to Mr. Gevaki our many donors and world-class faculty scientists for making today possible. And now I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Manis. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So let's say a few words about Daryl. Uh, Daryl, much like the inaugural Giviki shareholders, is incredibly accomplished. Has had an amazing professional life has been of great service to our region and beyond, and really is a true visionary. Daryl Givicki was born in, on a farm in Nebraska and liked cars, even at a young age. He graduated from high school in 1943 during the Second World War. That same year, Mr. Givicki joined the Merchant Marines, part of the US military, and traveled the world. After his service, he settled in Stockton, and shortly after arriving, he went to work for a local automobile dealer, where he learned about the car business. He learned well, obviously. In 1966, he opened his first auto dealership in Lodi, Givicki Ford. Over the next several decades, Darrell would go on to become almost synonymous with car dealerships in the region. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, his business grew to include hotels, a convenience store, a car wash, and an office and retail building. Darrell married his wife, Opal, in 1949, and they spent 68 wonderful years together before Opal passed away in 2018. The couple raised four children, and Darrell now has 12 grandchildren and 19 great-grandchildren. Darrell's relationship with the Eye Center began when he developed glaucoma, and he turned to Dr. Brandt for, for his care and expertise. Darrell and Dr. Brandt developed a very special connection, and Darrell's desire to ensure that future generations would benefit from the expertise and novel research of our UC Davis Eye Center faculty grew into his commitment to fund not one, but two endowed chairs. His gift funded our first endowed chair for a, for a glaucoma clinician scientist, as well as our first endowed chair for a basic scientist. After receiving a BS from Yale University, we'll talk a few, a few minutes about Dr. Brandt, 
After receiving a BS from Yale University from Harvard Medical School, Dr. Brandt's ophthalmology training began with a postdoctoral research fellowship at Harvard before starting his residency at the Doheny Eye Institute. He completed his glaucoma fellowship at the Wills Eye Hospital prior to joining the UC Davis faculty in 1989. Dr. Brandt's fellowship mentor, a world-renowned ophthalmologist and director emeritus of the glaucoma service at Wills Eye Hospital, Dr. George Spaeth could not be here today, but he asked me to tell Jamie that he sends you his sincerest congratulations. Jamie Brandt is a fine person who is eminently deserving of this professorship. Dr. Brandt has served as principal investigator for many landmark clinical trials and serves on numerous editorial boards and in leadership roles for the American Glaucoma Society. At the Eye Center, he is professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and director of the Glaucoma Service, as well as vice chair for international programs and new technologies. He has also developed an informal role as director of ideas. He's got lots of ideas. <laughs> Dr. Marge Armstrong, <clears throat> Dr. Marge Armstrong earned his PhD in neuroscience also from Harvard University. After postdoctoral training at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, Department of Embryology, he joined the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Departments of Neuroscience and, and Ophthalmology in 2001. Nick joined the UC Davis faculty in 2016, and I would categorize his recruitment as a monumental accomplishment for our department and our ability to hopefully develop regenerative therapies for blinding eye diseases and in particular glaucoma. Nick's science is impressive alone, but he also managed to drive hundreds of frogs across the country <laughs> when moving from, from Baltimore to Davis. It, it was a nail biter, I assure you. At UC Davis, Nick is a researcher and professor in the Department of Ophthalmology. He quickly has developed a reputation as an exceptional collaborator, mentor, and scientist. He's also involved in extensive grant reviewing, editorial work, and other activities promoting glaucoma research. I deeply value Dr. March Armstrong for uh, enthusiasm for science, but also for his clear focus in bringing treatments to cure our patients. Um, I might also add that Dr. Brandt is one of only 70 researchers worldwide who has been elected to the Glaucoma Research Society in 2003. Another esteemed member of our department, Dr. Gary Novak, uh, was elected to this group in 2012. And this year, Nicholas Marsh Armstrong will be inducted into the Glaucoma Research Society, making us, if not the most, one of the most well-represented research entities in this elite group. I can think of really no one more observed, more deserving or fitting to serve as our inaugural chairholders than these two amazing gentlemen. It's my great honor now to introduce two uh, guests, Tom Bruner, President and CEO of the Glaucoma Research Foundation, and Rick Lewis, former director of the Glaucoma Service here at UC Davis, co-founder of Sacramento Eye Consultants, past president of the American Glaucoma Society and the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Tom Bruder joined the Glaucoma Research Foundation in 2003 after a successful 30-year career in the ophthalmic laser business. Since joining the GRF, Tom has helped to, to more than double the revenue and focus on, a, on innovative research to understand how glaucoma and sight find a cure a glaucoma steel site and finds a cure. He received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society for Laser Medicine and Surgery for his contributions and 25 years of service to the Board of Directors. Tom actively supports development of new products 
to help those with glaucoma and other eye diseases as an advisor or board member for startup companies in eye care. And through his leadership, the Glaucoma Research Foundation has become an incredible partner to UC Davis faculty and to many other faculties in our shared mission to find a cure for glaucoma. Rick Lewis is very well known in this community in our region and internationally as a leading glaucoma specialist, an exceptional clinician, and an innovator and entrepreneur. After completing his residency at UC Davis Eye Center, actually the year I came as a young faculty, Rick went on to complete a glaucoma fellowship at the University of Iowa and then returned to UC Davis uh, to lead our glaucoma service, serving as Dr. Brandt's predecessor. After establishing the Sacramento Eye Consultants, Rick has remained a supportive partner to our department, encouraging and helping to foster innovation among our faculty and proving the highest level of, level of care for his patients. Dr. Lewis has served as the Chief Medical Officer of Airy Pharmaceuticals and was the recipient of the Pink Horse Medal, a very prestigious and well-deserved honor given by the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Rick and Tom, uh, many thanks to both of you for making this special evening for our honorees. And Tom, I'd like to invite you now to the podium. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, for your kind introduction and, and kind words. And it really is a pleasure to be here uh, and to, in a small way, help to honor these two very deserving gentlemen. Um, actually, uh, they've been my friends now for 20 years. Uh, when I first joined the Glaucoma Research Foundation in 2003, uh, Jamie was on our board of directors and uh, actually was involved with our research and education activities, I think chaired those committees. And um, I did like the comment about his, you being director of ideas, because one, one of the things I kind of remember is as we would meet at uh, American Glaucoma Society meetings or at other meetings, you often would pull me aside and say, well, Tom, I've got this really great idea <laughs> that we ought to look at. And um, I should have paid more attention, I'm sure, to more of those. Uh, but I really uh, thank you for your support at Glaucoma Research Foundation and for helping us to launch uh, one of our big meetings, Glaucoma 360, which is a meeting about innovation in ophthalmology and in glaucoma particularly. And Nick and I also met early on, and um, shortly after I joined Glaucoma Research Foundation, I was told that there was one very important activity which was a, called the Catalyst for a Cure, and it was a collaboration among four scientists to really understand what were the earliest changes? What, how did glaucoma, what, what caused it? How did it happen? And um, the unique thing about this research effort was none of the people on it had ever worked on glaucoma. And we wanted to find people who didn't already know the answers. And Nick was one of that team. And I uh, remember going to one of your meetings in Las Vegas. They, one of the things that we encouraged was frequent collaboration and really working closely together. And it was just, uh, I feel so fortunate to have had the chance to work directly with Nick and to have been involved with Jamie early on and to see the contributions that both of them have made to uh, ophthalmic research. Um, you've heard a little bit about Nick, Nick's research and we were talking earlier about uh, some of the first, very first ideas and how today these are becoming so important in the latest uh, glaucoma research. So it's also a real honor to um, witness this investiture and I want to also acknowledge uh, Daryl Opal and Daryl Givicki uh, for their support and just would say that as Nick and I were talking earlier, it's philanthropists like uh, the Givikis that make this kind of innovative research possible. The kind of work being done by Jamie and by Nick 
would not be funded necessarily by the National Institutes of Health or the National Institute. And this, these sort of high risk, high reward kinds of research really depend on philanthropy. So I think uh, Davis should be very proud of their success um, and the opportunity to recognize these gentlemen. So thank you so much and thank you for the chance to be here. Well, Mark, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, again, my name is Rick Lewis. I'm a uh, recently retired uh, clinician here in, in Sacramento, and I look out and see uh, many of my old colleagues here. And you know, Mark has done a nice job of telling us where the department is now. But uh, when I came 43 years ago in uh, 1979, uh, Mark hadn't even arrived yet, and the department had three full-time faculty. Uh, one of whom was Alan Roth, who was a pathologist. Uh, and most of our teaching was really done by the clinical faculty, including Mike Shermer and Neil Kelly, who, uh, you know, got us going. Uh, you know, you think back to where you, where you are now and the resources you have and, and, and the skills in this incredible university here. Uh, but in the beginning, uh, I was a, I think, a second year resident, so it must have been 1980, and the chairman of the department, John Keldner, said to me, you know, uh, our previous glaucoma faculty member was Dr. Portnoy, who died unexpectedly from a, I think it was a surgical uh, mishap of some kind. And um, they needed a glaucoma person. And he said to me, I know you're thinking of doing cornea, but we've got Mark Manis coming out. So why don't you go off and go to Iowa and do, and do glaucoma? And you'll come back, and you'll be our glaucoma guy. And uh, you know, I was very lucky. I actually end up loving glaucoma and uh, really appreciated the chance to initiate the glaucoma program here. So I worked here for five years until Jamie came over and really made progress. I, uh, Jamie took it to a whole different level. Um, and now I look back, and I think you've got somewhere upwards of 15 faculty members. I think you have about 10 to 15 researchers purely for ophthalmology without the, the cross-fertilization that goes on with, uh, with the Davis campus. And uh, I look out here at this audience, and it's really remarkable. The billion dollars that was talked about, the kind of research that, that these two folks have done, uh, they have certainly helped me in my clinical work. And I think it's a great honor, and I'm proud to be here to, uh, to celebrate with you. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Please join me now in watching a brief video honoring the remarkable uh, contributions of Dr. Brandt and Dr. Marsh Armstrong and expressing our gratitude to Daryl Givicki for his very significant investment in glaucoma research and the wonderful partnership guided by our shared mission to find a cure for glaucoma. So as a former UC Regent, I understand how we measure quality in our faculty, and we measure it based upon research, teaching, and service. And at the professor level, we expect our faculty to have a worldwide or an international reputation. Dr. Brandt checks all those boxes. My name is Robert Price, and my son is Bobby. It's his first birthday, and you know we really didn't expect anything serious. We didn't know. And Dr. Brandt um, told us your son has congenital glaucoma in both eyes and he needs to be operated on immediately. So as you can imagine, uh, my wife and I were kind of panicked and Dr. Brandt was great with us explaining the disease and the procedure, what the eye center would be able to, to do for him, what he would be able to do for him. His dedication to his patients, his long-term plans for his patients. It's, it's incredible. He is a very clear thinker and a very, very smart about trying to solve problems. Probably most well-known is his work on the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study, which goes by the acronym of OATS. He thinks about things from a mechanistic standpoint 
to try to figure out why something is going awry in a person's care. I think he always has a lot of substance behind the advice that he gives you. However, an incidental finding in that study was one Dr. Brandt was really key in leading, and that was the thickness of the cornea was important in how you measured intraocular pressure, as well as a separate factor for the development of glaucoma. That has really changed the care of glaucoma patients today. Within 24 hours, our son Bobby was in surgery, and Dr. Brandt and his team of surgeons came out of the OR to the waiting room to tell my wife and I that the surgery had been successful. And uh, I'll never forget, he, he told us, you're gonna be in my life and I'm gonna be in your life and your son's life for a long time, and we're gonna take good care of him. He, you know, wants the best for his patients. All of his experience and expertise um, really helped support him in that mission. Um, but ultimately it comes down to, you know, he's a good doctor because he cares for his patients. For years, Dr. Brandt and other members of the Eye Center staff would visit around the world through Orbis. And he would go into these countries that hardly had any major medical availability at all. He would provide services for the patients. But in the meantime, while he's doing that, he would be teaching the local doctors how to perform these same services and how to better diagnose and treat the patients in their country. On the international reputation, whenever I go anywhere and I tell people that I am part of the UC Davis ophthalmology department, usually the next question is, do you know Jamie? There is quite a bit about Nick Marsh Armstrong that is wonderful. He's a very fun person with a special sense of humor, but something I really appreciate about him and his science is that he's extremely rigorous, especially when you study something like a disease and you're trying to come up with a cure. It's very important that every step we take is based on something that's very solid. And Nick's studies are always very careful and really well done. I first had the privilege of meeting him when he came to the Ice Center Executive Advisory Group to give us a presentation. I love to talk about uh, Dr. Marsh Armstrong's work to my patients. So when my patients come in, a lot of people will say, hey doc, is there anything new in glaucoma? You know, there isn't anything right now, but what I say is we have this really exciting researcher, Nick Marsh Armstrong, who is actually working on regenerating the optic nerve and he's, you know, he's trying to unlock these secrets of how that happens. He's a fantastic mentor and he's teaching, you know, a whole new cohort of scientists and I've seen them flourishing and becoming really good scientists um, as they graduate and move on. And so I think that his skills for teaching are very impressive too. And when he finished that presentation, it was one of the first times that I truly felt hope. The advantages that being bestowed an endowed chair is that it removes any barrier that a clinician scientist may feel for engaging and participating in discovery and translational research in order to benefit patients by bringing a discovery to the bedside. I think endowing a chair is one of the the most powerful things you could do with your philanthropy. If I had, you know, the means to do it, that would be my way of giving back. I'd like to say thank you to Daryl Gillicky for his donation. I do know that without donors like him, there's a chance that the Eye Center wouldn't be able to continue its mission, wouldn't have the capabilities to attract top-tier talent, to retain specialists like Dr. Brandt. It does make a difference in people's lives. So I really appreciate Daryl Gibbicky for, for giving these two endowed professorships, which have really a, a, a lifetime or beyond lifetime, really in perpetuity, to really help our department to understand glaucoma better. And the more we understand the disease, the better we're able to figure out novel treatments. The newly endowed chairs, the Department of Ophthalmology, and the many patients who will benefit from the Givicki endowed chair would like to thank Mr. Givicki for this magnificent gift. <laughs> Truly, it is an amazing gift, and 
Daryl, uh, we hope that with this video we were able to reflect with the sincere gratitude that we have for your investment in vision science to the support of these two stellar faculty members. As a small token of our appreciation, Daryl, uh, we have a, uh, a small memento that was inspired by a gift that you gave to Jamie Brandt several years ago that makes me smile every time I go into Jamie's office. For those of you who have not had a chance to be in Dr. Brandt's office, it's usually kind of messy, actually. <laughs> but uh, Daryl created a framed photograph that includes Dr. Brandt on one side and Thomas Edison on the other side with the caption, Two Geniuses. Uh, our version includes you, Daryl, Dr. Brandt, and Dr. Marsh Armstrong with the caption, Three Geniuses. By way of explanation to those of you that, who are not wedded to academia, a gift to establish a chair uh, creates a permanent endowment for the holder of that chair. Each year the chair holder can use the interest on that uh, endowment on the principle to invest in meaningful academic pursuit above and beyond the delivery of health care. As such, an endowed chair is truly a catalyst for new discoveries in medicine. Daryl and Opal's names will be carried forward in perpetuity to symbolize their dedication to the expansion of critical expertise and discovery as we set the platinum standard for eye care and vision research. And when Dr. Brandt retires, not for many, many years, and Dr. Barge Armstrong retires, the, there will be uh, new shareholders that will bear the Giveke name. I would now like to ask Dr. Murin to join me at the podium, Dr. Brandt and Dr. Marsh Armstrong to join me, and I'd like to call on our two most recent endowed chairs, Dr. Paul Seaving, uh, the uh, Neil and M.J. Kelly Presidential Chair in Vitreoretinal Science, and Dr. Susanna Park, the Barbara and Alan Roth Chair, to join me up here on the podium. Armstrong. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I get to watch what he does. And I goes, uh, this goes in back. This goes in the this back. Goes in back. Okay. There you go. If you'll present the plaques, we are. We are. Dr. Brandt. Dr. Brandt. Well, we now have two new endowed chairs. Pleasure to call on Dr. Brandt to say a few more words. Well, lose the glasses. Wow. Okay. Standing here and hearing all these kind uh, comments is very humbling. Uh, Dean Murin, Tom Bruner, Rick Lewis, thanks so much for your comments and, and taking the time to be here today. Your presence means, means a lot to me uh, personally, for my family, and for the department. 
I also want to thank Aaron Bauer, Rebecca Sabotin, and Kimber Chavez and their team for having arranged such a wonderful event. I arrived. I arrived at UC Davis in 1989 as a newly minted glaucoma specialist hoping to forge a career as a clinician scientist, but I wasn't really sure where to begin nor where that path would lead. Looking back 33 years, that's a third of a century, okay, it's clear that the old saying, it takes a village, certainly applies to the creation of an effective clinician scientist. So I have many people to thank. But first, let me tell you about Daryl. I first met Daryl in the early 90s, and we hit it off immediately. Those of you who know Daryl will recognize this. He would start off every visit with a mischievous grin and then tell a really, really corny joke, <laughs> what these days would be called a dad joke. Once I got to know him, I began each visit standing in the door waiting for him to tell me the joke before we'd commence with the exam, and he never disappointed. Daryl has trusted me with his ophthalmic care ever since and even participated in a clinical trial of a new drug that I uh, ran in the late 90s. When Daryl contacted me in early 2019, saying he wanted to make a major uh, donation to support our glaucoma research, he told me that he had in mind buying some equipment or equipping a lab to support our research endeavor. And I felt I knew him well enough to respond with, thanks, but hold that thought. Let's talk about this. And Aaron Bauer and I traveled down to meet him in his office in Lodi just a few weeks later. And we described to him the history of endowed chairs and professorships, uh, beginning with the Lucasian Professorship of Mathematics at Cambridge, held by Sir Isaac Newton and more recently by Stephen Hawking. As a successful businessman, Darrell understands the importance of human capital, and I think he immediately understood how an endowment would, far more than purchasing some equipment, would assure that UC Davis would continue to attract the best and the brightest to grow as a global center for glaucoma care and research far into the future. And Darrell's vision is what we celebrate today. So about that village I told you about. When I came out of fellowship, I had many job opportunities. But when John Keltner recruited me, I recognized this special collaborative place he'd developed, that Davis Nice atmosphere um, that Mark Manis has continued to build upon. I chose to come here because Davis just felt right, and I've never regretted that decision. As we continue to grow and move into the Chan and I Institute, I hope we will never lose that David, Davis Nice reputation. It's what people around the country recognize as the core of this department, and it what makes this institution and our department in particular so very special. After three decades, I probably owe my deepest gratitude to John Keltner. As I began my career, I wasn't sure if my research focus would be in the lab or in the clinic, and John helped me explore both options soon after I started. John connected me to Roy Curry, then chair of human physiology, and I eventually made my way to the lab of Martha O'Donnell, with whom I partnered, and where we showed that an ion transporter that she had identified and characterized seemed to underlie important aspects of intraocular pressure reg regulation. Key to that research was a seed grant from the Glaucoma Research Foundation in San Francisco. So it's particularly meaningful that Tom Bruner is here today. GRF's role in facilitating both early stage research and multi-institution collaboration with their Catalyst for a Cure program has been priceless. Nick Marshall Armstrong and I are both examples of GRF's outsized impact. So today is a special day for GRF as well. My work with Martha and Roy resulted in several important papers outlining new ideas about how trabecular meshwork regulates pressure. In fact, our work generated several patents for new glaucoma drugs that were licensed by the university to Merck. And despite success in getting these drugs to work in monkeys at Merck, Merck unfortunately abandoned their glaucoma uh, program in the late 90s. And th that work went no further. Those patents have since expired, but I hope someday another company will take them, our approach and run with it. 
Also in the late 1990s, the ocular hypertension treatment study, or OATS, which you heard about, was being planned, and John encouraged me to be, apply to become a principal investigator in what was destined, destined to be a two-decade-long, $40 million um, landmark study funded by the NEI. UC Davis was the largest clinical site in the OATS, and the OATS helped jumpstart the world-class clinical trials group that we have here at UC Davis. I had the unique aha moment when I recognized that central corneal thickness, and in particular thin central corneal thickness, or CCT, was probably an unrecognized and potent rec uh, risk factor for glaucoma. With additional support from the National Eye Institute in collaboration with my OATS colleagues and over 1,636 patients around the country, we went on and proved that this was indeed the case. In fact, thin central corneal thickness explains much of the increased risk of glaucoma in patients of African heritage and also among patients who've undergone laser refractive surgery. That discovery has had an outsized impact on patient care, allowing us to target and aggressively treat patients at the highest risk of, of glaucoma, while at the same time stop treatment and reassure patients in the much larger group who we now understand are at extremely low risk. It's particularly gratifying when I encounter individuals among the thousands, perhaps millions of patients globally who've avoided years of using expensive and uncomfortable drops and living in fear of blindness, we could finally identify those who were unlikely to get the disease. Michelle Lim joined UC Davis as my partner in 2000 and has become a steadfast friend and collaborator ever since. She's the person I go to when I have yet another harebrained idea, and I trust her to tell me when she thinks I'm nuts. Thank you, Michelle. The two of us started a glaucoma fellowship in 2006 and have since trained 17 clinical fellows and six research fellows. Michelle and I learn just as much from our fellows as we teach them, and every one of them has been, become part of our extended families and our glaucoma family. In fact, Michelle and I have traveled to the weddings of five of them. They've also become part of the extended community of glaucoma clinicians around the country, and we reunite each year at the annual meeting of the American Glaucoma Society. The AGS is a wonderful organization of glaucoma specialists that, thanks to leadership of presidents like Rick Lewis, speaks with one voice on behalf of our patients and our field. A few years ago, I was commenting to another former president of the AGS, Dale Hoyer, a close mutual friend of Rick and mine and a friend of many in this audience, and I was commenting that there was a remarkable lack of big toxic egos in the field of glaucoma. And his response was, of course, glaucoma is a very humbling disease. <laughs> Most of you know, if you didn't know already, um, that my biggest passion in glaucoma is the care and management of infants and children with the disease. I have a pretty unusual practice. It's not uncommon for my clinic to have a newborn infant in one room and a 90-year-old patient in the next, both with glaucoma. Each presents their own challenges and rewards, but the stakes in a newborn of getting it right the first time and preserving a lifetime of vision is the most important thing that I do. Childhood glaucoma is rare, but it's rapidly blinding if not caught early and treated early, so it remains among the most common causes of blindness in young children worldwide, even here in the United States. Over the last three decades, we've been able to build a childhood glaucoma center at UC Davis that draws children from around the country and around the world. Having been here three decades, I'm now operating on the children of kids that I operated on in the early 90s. And with new understanding of the disease, we can now identify the exact molecular mutation that caused the disease in about a third of the patients. We also now have new options to offer these children. I'm grateful to my friend Malvina Edelman, who directs the ophthalmic devices division at FDA. Despite the pandemic, I was able to convince her and her team at FDA to allow me to trial a new approach to childhood glaucoma that appears to be a promising new minimally invasive procedure for this blinding disease. In the developing world, a diagnosis of childhood glaucoma is a sentence of lifetime blindness, if not death. A blind, half of blind children in the developing world don't make it to five years of age. I have had the honor of partnering with Orbis International to train eye surgeons in Africa, Asia, South America on how to deal with childhood glaucoma surgery, and in so doing have trained ophthalmologists who become the go-to experts for child disease, uh, childhood disease in places like Ghana, Indonesia, Nepal, Vietnam, and others. And they too have become another extended part of the UC Davis glaucoma family. So family, that's what it's all about, isn't it? 
Uh, my biggest thanks of all go to my wife of 37 years, Karen, who followed me through training around the country and ended up landing with me here in Sacramento 33 years ago. She's been my rock ever since we met in Boston almost 40 years ago. Every anniversary, we look at each other and say with some amazement that we're still talking to each other. I know we'll still be talking to each other for the rest of our lives. Sacramento has turned out to be a wonderful place to live and raise a family. There's no better example of this than our son Michael, who is here today with the two newest members of our family, his wife Casey and, our, and their daughter Zoe, the best daughter-in-law and granddaughter anybody could ask for. So thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Marsha Armstrong. Wow, that's a little bit hard to follow. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, Susan, Tom, and Rick for your uh, very kind words. Um, uh, yesterday, um, I was in the lab with my student, Yerem, and uh, we were uh, planning some experiments uh, for you know, this new um, connection that we've seen um, um, between Alzheimer's disease and glaucoma. And we were going through data for years um, that were findings that just made no sense to us. And it's just that we're trying to plan the next set of experiments. And, you know, in doing so, had what is incredibly rare, which is, and uh, uh, Jamie referred to it as an aha moment. Um, and it, it was a moment where um, all these, um, Things that made no sense suddenly made sense. And that was great because it allowed us, it made perfectly clear what our next experiments needed to be, uh, which we're going to start. Actually, Yaram, I think, started them this morning. Um, but it also, because of the potential impact uh, that this may have, if we're right. Um, so those aha moments in science are incredibly rare. Um, I've only had a few over the course of my career um, that you know really make you feel that you can make a difference. Um, you know, most of what we do as a basic scientist is humdrum, it's routine, it's often frustrating. Uh, but it's those aha moments that really makes you feel that you can do something, give something back. Um, so um, this morning, actually, and I didn't even tell my wife this, uh, <laughs> was thinking in the shower about, wow, I just have this insight. Can I, you know, and this idea that there's these very small number of rogue cells that are damaging axons, making blindness occur in, in glaucoma. And, and you know, I think I know what to do about it, but I just don't know how to target these drugs to these specific cells. And I still don't know that. I think it's incredibly difficult. Um, and certainly it's not something that it could ever get funded from a funding agency. It's just too risky. You know, these are the types of ideas that having an, an endowed professorship enables me to do now. That is, it's, and so uh, Daryl, if you're watching, thank you. Uh, this is from my perspective, what, what you're, you're, you're giving me and you're giving um, the field. Um, so basically, you know, what you're doing is enabling science that would otherwise not happen. And I think that's incredibly powerful. So, but what if I'm wrong, right? And this is the, the beauty of, of this being an endowed professorship that after me, others will come, right? And other basic scientists will be able to take their ideas, the most daring ideas, and apply them to this disease. So in terms of, you know, Jamie said it, that, you know, this is, uh, there's many people to be thanked. And I actually want to start by thanking Jamie because Jamie had the personal relationship with Daryl, and it's their vision who made it such that there would be not just a clinical chair, but also a chair dedicated to basic research. Um, and I think that's incredibly visionary and incredibly important. Um, so, and I think that that's, you know, you know it's, it's partially because Jamie is a visionary, so thank you, Jamie. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Manas uh, for bringing me here to the department um, you know, about six years ago. 
um, when I moved uh, here from uh, Johns Hopkins. Also like to thank uh, Ernest Shannon who actually gave the money um, that made the creation of my laboratory possible uh, before he even went even further and gave the money that made the new ophthalmology department possible. So thank you, Ernest. I'd like to thank, I saw Paul Fitzgerald someplace. I uh, can't see you now, but I want to there, thank you for creating in, in the department, his department of anatomy in my basics lab is in, in house in that department. It's created an incredibly uh, positive um, environment to do science. He's recruited incredible basic scientists, vision scientists, but moreover, he's created an environment that is incredibly collaborative and conducive to good science. I'd like to thank Aaron and, and the rest of the development team because honestly, you know, none of this would happen without them. So thank you. Um, um, I also want to thank um, my trainees. Actually, there's there's three of them here, and I'm going to embarrass you if you can either raise your hand or stand. Zhang Ha, Lindsay, and Yerem, um, um, that are, you know, as I see it, research is a team sport. And oftentimes, you know, the best thing that the, the uh, coach can do is appreciate, you know, what abilities they have and then just get out of the way. So thank you, uh, and uh, because it really is, as I view it, you know, this endowment that goes to me, in fact, is, is just, it's really going to the laboratory. It's the Marsh Armstrong Laboratory that is a team. Um, so thank you also for, for coming here. But of course, the, the, the highest thanks goes to my wife, uh, Kara, who's sitting back there, and my daughter, Auden. Um, also, I, I hope my other two kids, Brennan and Gwen, may be watching, uh, couldn't make it. And they know that you know, being a basic scientist is, is sometimes, uh, you know, the, the greatest challenge is work-life balance because we're, in some ways, often married to our job. And um, it's, it's, you know, through their support that none of this, without which, none of this would have been possible. I'd like to also thank Tom, um, Tom from the Great Glaucoma Research Foundation. Um, when I was just a, a young person starting my own independent career, it was the Glaucoma Research Foundation that invested in me, as Tom mentioned, somebody who knew nothing about glaucoma. I was a hired gun, if you will, because I had a certain set of skills. Um, and um, I, I've always been ambitious uh, in terms of my thinking, big ideas, but I'm really just a nuts and bolts scientist, which is what I remain. That is, I try to figure out what's wrong and I try to fix it. Um, but it was through the Glaucoma Research Foundation that um, was, gave me, essentially launched my career in glaucoma. So the fact that I'm receiving this today, uh, a lot of that is owed to you and the Glaucoma Research Foundation. So thank you. Um, so, but I of course want to end uh, with Daryl Kiwiki and saying that it's to you that the greatest thanks goes, that um, it's that commitment to basic science that I think is truly exceptional, uh, as well as the clinical science. And basic science is truly the foundation of future medicine. So um, I, um, I can't promise you that I'm going to cure glaucoma. I can promise you that I will try my, I will use your money wisely and I will try my best uh, to deliver you know, it's basic science to make those in the future less likely to lose their sight due to glaucoma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I think you can all see how lucky we are. And uh, Jamie and Nick, uh, congratulations to you both. This is truly well deserved. We owe Daryl Givicki a huge and profound debt of gratitude for his investment in vision science and patient care. Um, we are honored to be stewards of this donation. And we thank you, all of us, the Dean and all of us at UC Davis, for your investment in us. I'd also like to thank Tom once again and Rick Lewis 
for being here with us today. And what I'd like to do is close the ceremony with a short recorded message from one of the deans of American glaucoma, Dr. Harry Quigley from the Wilmer Eye Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. He recorded a short message for Jamie and Nick. It's a great pleasure for me to be asked to say something about Jamie Brandt and Nick Marsh Armstrong uh, on the occasion of their receiving this wonderful gift. There are very few ophthalmologists and clinician scientists uh, in the world who have fundamentally changed an important uh, aspect, both of the nature of glaucoma and also the diagnosis and management of glaucoma, and Jamie Brandt is one of those people. He made the unique observation during the study called the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study that it would be important to take into account whether the corneal thickness was relevant in measuring eye pressure, the, the short-term outcome that we watch in glaucoma. Many of us, my lab particularly, have been chasing this particular thing since uh, Dr. Brandt made that observation. His second major contribution is that there are probably only two or three people in the United States who are expert at the uh, situation of children with glaucoma. And in order to get to be an expert in that area, people have to know and trust that when they send a child to you, not only from the local area, but from national uh, sites, that the family and the child are going to get the special kind of care and the high quality care that Dr. Brandt provides. So it's great that the department and your donors have recognized his importance and what will be, I'm sure, uh, further contributions to the field. It may or may not be known to the people there in California that Nick Marsh Armstrong and I first met close to 15 years ago. Nick had a, a small laboratory inventively studying uh, Xenopus and the eyes of frogs and had gotten interested in whether or not you could do some of the things in mammals to study eye disease that he was doing as basic work in, in the study of the eyes of amphibians. I was pleased to write two papers with Nick as he began moving from taking basic scientific facts and applying them in a way that would become translational features of our understanding of disease. And as I look through his CV now, Nick has studied not only glaucoma, as he did with us, diabetic retinopathy, Alzheimer's disease, and applied the findings from his studies in a way that's rather special, including a major paper such as one in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which identified a fundamental property of the association between glial cells in the optic nerve and the axons of retinal ganglion cells in the optic nerve, something no one had ever realized before that the astrocytes are having lunch by biting off pieces of axons. Nick has gone on to work with uh, many scientists around the United States, and uh, it was a loss to Johns Hopkins and a great gain for your university that Nick decided to move to California. Finally, let me comment to your donor that our former chair, Dr. Arnold Patz, used to speak about asking patients to donate to a university, and he would refer to it as giving them an opportunity to help. And this is a spectacular help that has been given by this family to provide not only basic science, but clinical science to a university that is really one of the top places in the United States. Our donors here and yours there are special in our relationship with them, both as patients and as partners in the production of new knowledge and the training of young people to become the next generation of scientists. Thanks very much, and congratulations to UC Davis and to Jamie and Nick. Indeed, congratulations to Jamie and Nick. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. There's wonderful refreshments. Please uh, spend some time talking to our new chairs, and thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your being here.